Hi there, welcome to Boxing Deep Dive on Lyndon Hosking, and this is Dream Fight. And this is where we pick two legends of the sport, uh, past or present, and match them up against each other and break it down and discuss who we think who we think wins and why. I'm joined, as always, by Mr. Calm, Mr. Uh, Tazzy Brown, <laughs> always cool, calm, and collected. Peter Maniatis, always looking the goods, always the best dressed of all of us, and of course uh, Mike there, who. Hopefully, his internet getting a little bit better week by week. So, welcome, guys. Very good. Great to be on Thanks the show, for the guys. plug, mate. I'm, I'm um, Peter Maniata sent me a few messages about for some breathing exercises. So, I'm trying to work on that. And, um, <laughs> you know, I think I'm going to get a lot better with my temperament and my not letting things get to me. So, thanks, Peter. No yeah, worries. Right, right. we'll, we'll square it up with the quiz on Thursday. <laughs> Well, we had to get the episode started because it was nearly on uh, before we started. So we had to had to get the, the clock ticking so we, uh, we weren't wasting valuable air time. But before we get into um, tonight's fight, which is um, brought to you by uh, Mike there, um, last week's um, episode was Joe Calzaghi and Andre Ward. We did the Instagram poll. A lot better than this week. 50-50 it was for, um, for both of them, which is probably about right, I think. So, yeah, 50-50. So, interesting to see how this one goes this week. And, and um, Mike, you've got the, uh, the Aussie element this, uh, this week. Who have we got? We've got Jeff Fennick versus Irishman Barry McGuigan at Featherweight. At Featherweight. Okay. So, Barry McGuigan. So, I'm probably thinking Barry was probably about mid-80s and Jeff would have been, what, um, early 90s, I'm probably thinking? 87, 88. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So tell us why you chose this one, Mike. What what makes you think this is such a great matchup? Well, just stylistically, I mean you've got one one fighter who really in McGuigan united both Ireland and the UK. If you look at his title winning effort against Pedroza, he headlined in London, which you don't ordinarily see Irishmen headlining in London. And big crowds. An exciting fan friendly style, body puncher. Very heavy-handed, but the kind of guy that would try and, like, touch you one, two, three shots and then gradually break you down with body shots. You know, very high KO percentage throughout his career, but all action. And seemed to get better outside of one bad night see, or one bad afternoon. Seemed to get better as the rounds wore on. So you counter that with Jeff Fennick, who's an Australian hero, who brings probably from 118 to 126 the most ferocious pace of all time. I don't think there's anyone historically you can look at that would bring the same intensity and infighting Fennec would. McGuigan's the slightly better puncher, but Fennec's the higher volume puncher, and we all know how clever, how clever Fennec was at closing range and getting on the inside and going to work. So it was a fight that was discussed for many years, and... People were kind of split in their perspectives. They just missed each other, probably by about a year or two. McGuigan on the comeback trail in the late 80s, it was still a hot discussion. So it's a fight that I think stylistically these two were made for each other because it's guaranteed fireworks at one stage in the contest. Mm. And Tazzy, um, very, uh, like Mike said, Jeff had the strength, but McGuigan had the, the left hook, the head and body. It was pretty potent at the time. Yeah, no, he could punch. Obviously, he had a lot of knockouts on his record and um, it was quite tough. And, um, you know, it was obviously it went to the Olympics as an amateur too. In Moscow, so yeah. Obviously, um, Moscow, yeah. So, you know, he was you know, a very seasoned fighter and, um, you know, being obviously an Irishman and, and, again, like, you know, with England, like he was a bit, he, he didn't really get involved much in the politics side of things. He sort of... You know, I think that was one of his things. I think his dad used to sing before his fights yeah, as well. Boy, so yeah. he, he, um, he's, a, he's a hero in, in Ireland. Any time I, I speak to any Irishman, when I've travelled to Canada or America, they obviously mention Barry McGuigan first and then later on we talk about, you know, Conlon and, and Frampton mm. and people like that. But, yeah, look, obviously, um, you know, great, great, great fighter, yeah. At the time, wasn't he, Pete? You remember the uh, he fought in massive crowds, and like Tassie said, his dad had seen Danny Boy, and he was really the uh, the Irish sort of matinee idol of the time, wasn't he? He was so popular. Yeah, massive, massively popular, and 
some fighters are just popular. He was like Ricky Hatton popular. Mm, he was. I mean, everyone mm. just loved mm. him. He was a guy next That's door big. you can have a drink with at the pub and heart and soul guy. And the way he fought, I mean, he used to put his heart into it. When he fought, the whole crowd used to get right behind him because mm. you knew that he was fighting from his heart. High octane, pure pressure fighter. He won a Commonwealth gold medal as well. So he's a very good amateur. I mean, he, mm. he had everything. Lineal featherweight world champion as well. So... This guy was no dummy. I mean, obviously the fight when he went across to uh, to Vegas and he fought Cruz, you know, in 40 degree heat wasn't the smartest management move, but it, it just it's, it wasn't his fault. I mean, you, your mm. fighter goes and fights wherever you put a fighter. I mean, you wouldn't be taking a a guy that fights in, in hot weather to Moscow in an outdoor stadium and, and fight him in minus eight degrees, would you? I mean, mm. it's the same thing. It just frees up. It's, well, Cruz it, wasn't expected it, to really be... Well, at that stage, wasn't really a top-line well, fighter. Wasn't it, it was a last-minute replacement, mm. wasn't it? Yeah. It was a, yeah. a fill-in fight. But it wasn't, the, it wasn't the, the fighter. It was the conditions. They had mm. to carry him out on a stretcher, and it was that badly dehydrated. It was, yeah. it was, it was dangerous. It was ridiculous to do that to a guy yeah. like that, and you don't considering really, where um, it was coming from. And you don't really see one, you don't see 15 rand fights anymore, but you also don't see fights in the middle of the uh, Las Vegas uh, summer either, do you? So um, that's enough the promoters of. Promoters uh, are smart. Yeah, let's, uh, that's enough of Barry. Let's uh, check out our man, the one and only Jeff Fennick. There he is, 29, 3 and 1, 21 KOs, three time world champion, should have been four, IBF band and weight champion, WBC. I should read Super Bantamweight Champion, sorry about that, and WBC Featherweight Champion, of course, 2002 International Hall of Fame inductee. And Tazzy, what more can you say about our man, Jeff Fennick? Well, mate, you know, he's the greatest Australian fighter of all time. And as I said, he, he is a four division champion because he definitely did beat the Zoom at that time. And just a great, a great, a great fighter, a legend. I mean, um, what can I say? Look, if you really only knew how bad his hands were, you'd probably you'd give him another three world titles on top of that because people can fight through anything, but him to fight with his hands broken all the time in training, injections before, 15 minutes before he walks to the ring, he went through hell. And I mean, he got to the point where he, he dropped his hands and he hit on the chin because he the, it was better than having the gloves up and copping the pain on the, on the hands. I mean, he went through everything. He, he never gave you room to spit. He backed his fitness. He was next level trainer. Nothing like anyone I've ever heard of. Um, tough, you know, on you all the time. It, you know, he used to throw Mexicans around. He used, mm. to, he used to out Mexican the Mexicans. Mm. Um, just a freak, mate, just a freak. Just a, you know, an ultimate, an ultimate fighter in every word. He made you fight three minutes of every friggin' round, every second. And um, yeah, you know, he was boxing in Australia. He kept it going. Got it back on track, you know, you know, and and what can I say? You know, he, he's the American for Mauler. He, he's he's one of the greatest fighters that God ever produced. Mm. And, and Mike, it, it, it's it's an interesting one with Jeff too, because we forget sometimes he only had I think it was a twenty three or twenty four amateur fights, including going to the Olympics, which is just unheard of. And then to win the world title in his seventh fight, and he's fighting these. You know, great fighters all around the world in, in his tenth, eleventh, twelfth fights, and we just sort of forget how good he was con uh, considering his experience. It was probably about a year ago that someone uploaded his fight from, I believe, it was the nineteen eighty three Australian National Championships on YouTube. Yeah, and I couldn't believe what I was watching because he was so raw and so novice, yeah. and his head was completely on the center line, and I was just trying yeah. to think to myself. How did this kid transition from here to becoming a world champion two years later? Yeah. How from there was he able to perform how he did at the Olympics? And the thing is with Jeff, it's the spirit that drove him. You would always hear people talk about, you know, defensively he's available to hit. Yeah, he's, he's, he might be available to hit, but when you hit him, he hits you with 10 back. Mm. He had a ferocity. He's one of the few fighters that when he tells you that, he had spite in his soul for the guy in front of him and he wanted to drown him. He's one of the few that you wholeheartedly believe because the way that he fought, if he got you in his wheelhouse, you weren't escaping the tornado. Mm. And I think that that's probably what his, his greatest attribute was that desire to win. You have fighters, you know, that desire to win, desire to improve. And 
as he rolled on in the pros, he actually become highly intelligent at learning how to anticipate on how to catch opponents' punches. And I think probably the reason why I consider Jeff one of the greatest infighters of all time is because he always knew where to place his head on the inside to be able to shuffle the other guy's weight around and make the opponent carry his weight, which is why, like you said, guys like Daniel Zaragoza, even guys like Marcus Villasana, who was an absolute savage on the inside, he was able to push him around and hold his own. Yeah, I was just going to say, Victor Collegius, I think, is... Um, is so underrated. He doesn't sort of get mentioned as far as his greatest opponents, but he's probably his most dangerous opponent apart from Nelson at the time, wasn't he? He was just a monster, was uh, Victor Collegius, and he just absolutely bought him for, for 10 rounds. So, um, Pete, it's, it's just amazing to think of this guy, how relentless he was, though, wasn't he? I mean, like Mike said, he could make relentless fighters um, look like, you know, like pretty meek. You know, he was just that type of guy who would take center ring every single time and he would just not give it up. I remember back in the day, it was a ring magazine. You'd get it once a month and you'd be hanging out to get it. And there was Jeff Fennick, front cover of the ring magazine, the second coming of Roberto Duran. Yep. And he had the goatee on. That, that's when I said, well, it, it, this guy was just, he was becoming a next level fighter. There was no one who was as strong as him, as spread away. No one that could punch as much as, I mean, he was punching 100 punches around. He was pushing big guys, bigger featherweights around. He was just, a guy was just an unstoppable force at the time. And um, you take away that that career after Azuma Nelson, and I mean, you just wonder and think what would have happened if he had got that fourth world title. Yeah, he was never the same, was he? Things would have been different. Mm. Um, and that's what we mentioned. Remember when we interviewed Andrew Maloney? Was he heartbroken after that second fight with Franco? Because sometimes once a fighter cops that, Sometimes it's hard psychologically to actually come back, and yeah. Jeff never came back from that. No, he didn't. So, I agree, yeah. yeah. No, he didn't. And um, and Tazzy, you just remember the the time when he was at his peak. He just transcended the sport, didn't he? He fifty, he fought in front of fifteen thousand people at the tennis center, and every single pub and club around Australia was absolutely packed. And he and you just never saw that uh, back in that time, was it? It was just he was just bigger than bigger than the sport in Australia. 100%, mate. I mean, you know, like, um, you know, and he beat, like, I mean, fighters that went on, you know, Greg Richardson and guys that he destroyed. I oh, mean, Zaragoza won, coffee, the, yep. yeah, Zaragoza won the title of Wayne McCulloch like, yep. a decade later. I mean, um, you know, um, Victor Collegius, Mario Martinez, you know, all these guys, mate, like Marcus Villasana, like, um, you know, just legends, mate. And as I said, he, he used to, um, out Mexican, the Mexicans, mate. He was mm. like a, um, like a Duran, like a Chavez. Um, and yeah, look, you know, if he, if that draw didn't happen to Nelson, as I said, who, who would have known? We'll never know. Um, no. But I mean, you know, and that's the thing that did break his heart. And he's, he's told me himself. I mean, I've had, you know, I was lucky enough to train with him for years and drive the train with him every day for about five years. And, Tease me the whole way every day, but anyway, um, it was. Um, but I mean, yeah, look at that bike. His heart it was never the same for the rematch, and and he um, he started doing things differently and probably cutting corners, which he never used to do. And um, yeah, yeah. But I mean, look, you know, as I said, he uh, like Peter said, been on the cover of the magazine, been spoke about Roberto Duran. That's his. That's how big he was. He got mm. to that level. Yeah. And the thing about it too, Mike, is that before we get on to Barry McGuigan, but one last thing with, with, with Jeff, um, let's face it, world champions can, can sort of hide if they want to hide it, I suppose, and just, you know, pick the right opponents. But like Tazzy said, the Marcus Villasanas, Tyrone Downs, Greg Richardson's, you know, th these were all top-line fighters that he fought. And um, so you've, you've got to give him credit as being, you know, legitimate world champion. Well, look even at Bantamweight. A bantamweight Fennec could have, no doubt, look, Shingaki, that was a manufactured mm. world title. Yeah. But yeah. look at who he chose to defend it against. Kofi was ranked top 10 across the board. Yeah. Steve McCrory was the Olympic gold medalist. Medal. So yeah. Fennec did good on his promise. He, he did good on the fact that he felt he was shafted at the 84 Olympics. And he went mm. out and picked the fight with the guy that took the place he felt belonged and mm. was his to go so, so that's essentially what drove him and then like i've always said with jeff people can talk about you know that oh he was better 
better managed or better promoted than other fighters. Whatever. When when you've beaten the amount of future world champions that he did, you can't deny the guy's place in yeah. history. Like Taz said, Zaragoza, Greg Richardson, Villasana. Tarati. People even forget guys, guys like Georgie Navarro. Georgie Navarro won the ESPN tournament and was a real slick mover and he just was. took his soul in five rounds. Mm. People forget that because a lot of these guys were never the same after a mauling from Fennec. Yeah. No, for sure. He dominated Tony Mad Dog Miller too. Yeah, I was at that fight yeah, exactly. and absolutely pummeled Tony Miller. I take, I tell you what, I take my hat off to Tony Miller. The fact that he survived twelve Moxie rounds it was against Fennec. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, Brian, Brian, yeah, no, Brian was in the corner. Yeah. Brian was in the corner with Tony Miller. Oh, was he? Oh, it was. I've yeah, never yeah. seen Mick, a guy cop so much punishment. Mick Hargraves mentioned that Peter about um when they seen Fennec. Yeah, you because know, they obviously respected Tony Miller and he had a big name. And then Fennec, he just said he looked amazing that night. Mm, he did. Because you know, if you think about, if you respected Miller, and all of a sudden Fennec was doing everything yeah. he wanted, just, yeah. Yeah, well, Tony Miller had um, lost a disputed decision to Lester Ellis, I think, um, not long before that. And then Fennec went down and absolutely pummeled him from pillar to post for, for 10 or 12 rounds, wherever and it was. But um, they, they had they had a boxing ring inside the city square and Jeff Fennick and Tony Miller turned up and Brian Levere was there and all the people were there. And, I mean, I, we used to get the thing that they were doing it, so we'd wag school and turn up there. It was always during the day. Yeah, for great the times. All right, yeah. well, let's get on to his uh, opponent, uh, Barry McGuigan, the Clones Cyclone, 32-3, and three, 28 KOs. Uh, w, WBA featherweight champion, uh, two successful defences, also the British and European featherweight champion, and the 2005 International Hall of Fame inductee. So, um, yeah, Mike, tell us a little bit about uh, Barry McGuigan and why you think he, he stands a chance against uh, our man Jeff. Well, like Kazzy said, you know, you guys said he was a Commonwealth Games gold medalist, 1980 Olympian. And he was a guy that really improved on the job. He suffered an early career loss to Peter Eubank. Old brother of Chris Eubank avenged that defeat and then pretty much wrote it to being the man to dethrone Eusebio Pedroza. Now, Pedroza was there for the taking. He was an aging champion, but nevertheless, he had been champion for many years, undefeated champ for many years, and McGuigan dominated him to a point that they... They, they, they couldn't deny him his mm. claim to being the lineal champion. So he rose to that occasion. Ironically, one of the first times he went the distance, which you've seen his knockout, there, knockout ratio there in 35 fights, mm. he ended 28 by stoppage. And he was the kind of guy that it was death by a thousand cuts. He had power with that left hook, but it was a combination of the left hook to the body and the left hook to the head. Mm. I think probably the best evidence of his quality as a fighter is that stoppage over Bernard Taylor because Bernard Taylor was a terrific fighter, very fast-handed American had previously drawn for the world championship and arguably won the first five rounds. And then McGuigan gradually took over, broke him to the body and stopped him from him in the eighth round. So it's just reflective of Barry's grit, Barry's determination. You see him there, just that crisp, strong, effective body for punching. And I think that Barry's Achilles heel, if anything, was movement, which with Jeff Fennick, he wouldn't find too much movement at all. It's going to mm. be two immovable forces going at each other. Yeah, but, I just remember it being but, uh, just massive back in the day. But um, but Tazzy, just rip hook, rip hook, rip hook. That's that's the style. Yeah, yeah. Well, obviously, it was very effective for him. And obviously, as Mike mentioned, Taylor was a great opponent, a great win. I think Taylor was the draw was with Pedroza, wasn't it, Mike? He draw with Pedroza Taylor. Yeah, for the title. And um so he's a, obviously a very good opponent. And then obviously Pedroza himself obviously took the title off. I mean, um, twenty defences or something for for the years he reigned and I think he Ruben Olivares and, and a lot of um great names he had, a lot of undefeated guys he defended against. So um, yeah, mate. It was obviously it's a great fighter, but I mean, if we, you know, only the two defenses, then the loss to Cruz, it was a, a late sub, obviously in the heat, like Peter mentioned before. Um, but yeah, he never really went on to regain the title. I think his last fight he lost to Jim McConnell. Mm. Um, that was his last fight, and um, TKO'd, and um, 
So, yeah, you had the three wins after the loss to Cruz and lost to Jim McConnell. But, I mean, obviously a great fighter. And, you know, anyone like Peter mentioned, if he was like Ricky Hatton, well, that's saying something because that's just, that means you've got a, a massive crowd behind you. And someone who someone who becomes a phenom like a Hatton or a, or a McGuigan, when you got, when you're selling out stadiums and you're taking 20,000 Brits to America, that's when you're really big time. I mean, you're so marketable. It's a huge ticket seller. Pete? So, yeah, oh, sorry, ahead, great for what? Yeah, no, say, just um, great for um, you know, we d- discussed obviously the you know the massive fan base both of them have. Before we get into our predictions, w- where does it take place? Is it at the Melbourne Park um, Tennis Centre or is it um, at Wembley Stadium? No, Neutral. I've seen put this it in at America. Stadium. I'll put it I've in America. It's at Wembley Stadium. Mm. Um, Neutral. Neutral. And uh, is it over twelve rounds or fifteen rounds? I think twelve. No, no, hang on. No, 15, 15. 15 was about that time. We'll keep it at 15. 15. Both of them fought 15 rounders, so we'll keep it yeah, at 15. Yeah, both did. I'd go, 12, I'd go 15 rounds, Wembley Stadium, the crowd rocking for both sides. All right. Well. And just before Australia plays England in the Ashes. <laughs> well, Tassie. So it's Aussie versus the Poms here. Yeah, uh, even though he's not Pom, he's Irish. He's yeah. Irish. Yeah. Okay, but they're. All right, Tazzy, kick us well, off, mate. Who wins and why? Yeah, well, I'm going to have my fight in America in a neutral turf because I don't, I'm not going to, I don't want Jeff going over there. But, um, mate, look, I love Mike. Mike Hatamura, as I spoke about him last week, is one of the most, my dearest friends. We, we meet up in Port Melbourne for coffees. We talk boxing and sometimes I shout, sometimes he shouts. Um, the Greensboro Guns thing. Well, this is probably one of the worst ideas ever, mate. <laughs> Fennec smashes, Fennec smashes this little Irishman. He sends him back to Ireland, battered and bruised, mate. You know, Jeff's just hustle bustles him and just dominates him. Look, it goes a distance still, but he just destroys him um, easily. Way too good, different class. This guy held the belt, lost it in two fights. Never regained it. Never won multiple divisions. Yeah, he beat an aging champion and he beat an okay contender. That's it. Jeff Jeff made Mexicans wish they were in Mexico. Jeff was an animal, a beast. And this is yeah, this is not a not a great matchup. It's not not bag and mic, but this is just this is just not worth even talking about. Fennec easily. So unanimous decision, was it? Yeah, but really bashes him, cuts okay. him up. Might stop him late. Ireland, Ireland has a, a public holiday in a memorial for how bad he gets beaten. The Irish are there crying and drinking whatever they drink. And it'll be remembered in history. It's the worst day in Ireland history since they got invaded, probably. Jeez, you got a bit to measure up to there. Pete, what do you think? Yeah. No, look, I think this fight for the start would be competitive. I mean... Brad McGuigan's a high-level fighter. He'd be out there. He'd be, he'd be definitely working away at Jeff early, and Jeff would be pushing him back. I think the f- first five or six rounds would be seesawing, but then Jeff's strength would start taking over, and he'd start backing him up. And um, I think by the end of the home stretch, it'll be all Jeff Fennick. So for mine, I've got Jeff Fennick unanimous decision. But in a real, real good fight, especially early, I think it'd be very entertaining early. Both fighters would be given and taken a lot the first five or six rounds. But I just think Jeff would be stronger and fitter and harder for longer. And he'd definitely edge out McGuigan in a unanimous decision and, and win comfortably. But he would have some rocky moments early in the fight. Okay. Well, I think by the look on Mike's face there, he might have a little bit of a different opinion. What's, uh, what are you thinking, mate? Who wins and why? No, I'm just thinking, why is Tazzy attacking me so strongly? <laughs> it's not He's you got personally. Got coming been, up it's not you, you, it's not you personally. You I love been, you. You must have been abandoned in a Caesar's Palace car park at some point in your life. In the <laughs> heat. I don't know. But but look, I think uh, I I picked this fight because I think it's a terrific styles fight. I look at one thing like the Hall of Fame is a contentious thing. But when you look at the Hall of Fame, Jeff Fennick, and I know this shouldn't affect stylistically, but Jeff Fennick went in 2002, which effectively you can go in 
five years, you go on the ballot five years after retirement. So essentially that means five years post-holiday, Fennick was on it the first time, he was straight in. McGuigan's last fight was, what, 90? Mm. Took him 15 years to go in. I think that that reflects to you how highly the industry thinks of Jeff and how he's perceived historically. So I look at this fight, I think that it doesn't matter where it's at. It could be in Caesars Palace in 50-degree heat. It could be in Ireland. It could be in the UK. It could be in Australia. I think Jeff is going to come out gunslinging. Jeff was always... On the big occasions, he was always overzealous early. Think Piyakarin, think McCrory. I actually think Jeff gets clipped early in the fight, gets knocked down maybe in round one or two, walks onto one of them counter hooks. But with Jeff, when those situations played out in his prime, it only served as an energizer. It served to make him hungry and smarter. And I think that gradually Phoenix starts overwhelming him, getting past that one, two, ta even taking the shot to the body, taking the shot to the head to get in. And once he gets in, he's out landing in four or five to one. And I just think as the fight progresses, I see Jeff probably around, maybe around 10 to 12, stopping him. I can't see it going 15. Mm. All right, so stoppage there for Jeff. I'm, um, look, I'm feeling squarely with uh, Tazzy here. I think that Jeff um, absolutely monsters uh, Barry. I just don't think... Um, Barry, look, Barry, Barry's like a typical um, sort of British fighter. They, they, they're obviously good fighters, but they're, they're sort of a little bit robotic, I suppose. I just think Jeff had a lot more dimensions to him. I just think, I, I think Barry would be he'd be game as usual, but I just think he, he's, he might be able to hold Jeff off for three or four rounds. But I think once Jeff got in close and got his range, he'd start pushing Barry back, and Barry couldn't fight on the back foot. I don't think. And I just think um, Jeff absolutely um, pushes him around, bullies him, bashes him, and probably stops him in about eight rounds. I just can't see any way that this fight's even competitive, to be honest, um, with all due respect, Mike. I just think Jeff is just too big, too strong, um, and I just think he would just absolutely monster McWigan. So I think eight rounds... You're not welcome... Stoppage. You're not walking with the Greensboro Cafe anymore, uh, Lyndon. <laughs> You've lost your invite there, mate. <laughs> hey, we all picked the same guy. We did. We all picked the same guy this week. We all just had a little bit more faith than others. So Tassie had unanimous decision, one-sided uh, decision. I think, Peter, you were the, the same. Mike had a 10th unanimous. or 12th round stoppage with a few rough moments. I think, Jeff, in eight one-sided rounds, the referee... Steps in and saves um, Barry from, from further punishment. I, don't, I couldn't see Jeff knocking him out, but I could see the referee definitely waving the fight off. So. See, now, if Jeff never had bad hands, we'll never know mm. what else he could have done. Yeah. Can you imagine going in the fights with your broken hands all the time mm. and sparring in camps yeah. or not sparring because you, you've got broken hands? I mean, mm. he deserves a medal for doing what he done. Yeah. No, yeah. he does. Um, but look... Having said that, even though you know we're all on uh, on Jeff with this one, I mean at the time Barry um, Wigan was a very very respected and, and dominant fighter, and it wasn't until Stevie Cruz took that aura away from him that he was again he was never the same. So I mean no, it wasn't time, a bad pick, Mike. It was a but good I, pick. But I think <laughs> what I will say though is we probably should thank Stevie Cruz because he saved because at the time, as you know, Mike um, McWigan and Azuma Nelson was the big fight at the time, and I just think Stevie Cruz saved. McWigan, a world of pain by getting in there with um, with a Zoom and Allison because I reckon that, that would have been ugly. But um, So that's that one. Unanimous for Jeff Fennick. Um, next week, it's, uh, it's my turn. I'm going to go for the big boys for this one. I'm going for prime Larry Holmes versus prime George Foreman. So that'll be a uh, mouth-watering heavyweight clash. I'm probably thinking 81, 82 version of Holmes versus probably 74, 75 or 73, 74 version of Foreman. Uh, I think it'll be a great that's one. A, that's a good one, mate. That's mm. a tough one. That's a yeah, tough one. That is yeah. a tough one. So not the old fat versions of both of them. We're after the prime Holmes and I better, Foreman. I better put out the old VHSs then for this yeah. week. <laughs> so, uh, so that's that one. All right. Well, thanks again, guys. I think... Um, I think, uh, Mike, you got to step up your game for your next pick, according to Tassie. Um, but, um, <laughs> but no, the great pick, mate. We, we, this is why we do it. We love debating it. And uh, it'll be interesting to see what the people on our Instagram poll uh, thinks as well. So Let me just say something, Lyndon. So, Mike, they've dropped the 510K rule, so I can come visit now at the Greensboro Milk Bar so we can catch up and... <laughs> and um... 
because yeah, the, the, K, the K order. rule is lifted now. All right, good stuff. I'll come boys. see you at Port Melbourne. I'm just worried about Ricky Nixon and his dodgy footy hitting me. <laughs> yeah, keep away from those foot, those Melbourne uh, footies, will you? The memorabilia. You got a spare, got a spare six hundred bucks, Mike. He grabbed my footy. Not for that. Not for that. <laughs> I see him. I see him all the time. The chicken is everywhere, mate. He's all around Port Melbourne, Bay Street. Unbelievable. Mm. He'll be in hiding now. Yeah. I think he would be. Yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, guys. Well, that's that wraps See up. See you, boys. Up. Dream fights all done for another week. Look forward to next week. Larry Holmes, George Foreman. Thanks again. See you, guys. See you, guys.